So 1.4 number 12 was to show that since A is, say, A11, A12, A21, A22, that A inverse ends up being 1 over A11, A22 minus A12, A21, all times the matrix of A22, and then negative A12, negative A21, and then A11. And for this particular section, uh, before darn it, why is that doing that? Before we have the ability to find inverses, which we do not yet have, uh, we had only the ability to show. And if you want to show something, that means that you would say that A times A inverse spit, better spit out I, and A inverse A better spit out I. And that's all that problem was. <laughs> Take this, times this, multiply it, it's going to end up being 1, 0, 0, 1. Flip the order, 1, 0, 0, 1. Oh, they have to be inverses of each other. Now, when I look at this, it actually gets kind of a nice property of solving all problems at the same time. So this is for any problem that is two by two. So if I look at this, there's no numbers in it. There's places to hold numbers. You know, we have lots of examples like that, like the quadratic equation. AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero. Solution, negative B plus or minus square root of B squared minus four AC all over two A, right? And the concept of something like that when we have things like AX squared plus BX plus C equals zero, therefore X is equal to negative B plus minus the square root B squared minus four AC all over two A. When I look at something like this, you say, oh look, I, I, I solved all of them to get something like that, like a formula, which is what I have up above. Along with the formula comes some, let's observe it for a little bit. For example, what name is that? What do we call it? The discriminant. Why? Because it discriminates the types of solutions. What's happening? I'm doing a plus or minus of that number. What if that number on the inside is negative? It's under the square root. If it's under the square root and I get a negative number, what type of solutions will this spit out? Complex. There'll be complex conjugates to each other. What if the thing on the inside is zero? What's the square root of zero? Zero. What's plus minus zero? Just the original. So how many solutions do you have? Two. It's just the same number. Negative b over 2a. It discriminates the types of solutions you get. The other is look at a. Can I use this to solve quadratics if a is zero? If a is zero, what does that tell you? It's not a quadratic. <laughs> you can't put zeros on the denominator, right? In other words, we look at things like this and say, all right, there's some flags that come along here. I can't handle that if this thing's a zero. This doesn't do anything. Well, that's because you can't solve a quadratic if you don't have a quadratic. That's what it really says. Now, that sort of stuff where it goes beyond, you know, do it, Memorize the formula and spit out the answer. It's, hey, we have a formula. Does this formula have some meaning for me? So if I look at this, and I plug in any numbers I want at all into there, there's obviously no restriction on the original matrix, right? My original matrix says, hey, plug in any number you want. If I look at this, there's no restrictions. I can plug in any number I want. If I look at that, we have a problem. If I look at that, I just can't plug in any number I want. I better not plug in numbers where the bottom ends up being what? Zero, because that thing won't exist. If the bottom is zero, this thing doesn't exist at all. And that's the beginning of our process. Right? We'll simply say, that, hey, see that guy on the bottom? He seems to determine if this thing exists or does not exist. So maybe we should give it a name. The determinant. Just like the thing with the solving the quadratic was the discriminant. This determines if this particular 2 by 2 inverse even exists. 
So we're going to call that its own name. And it's not the, not the inverse itself, but the thing that says if I would look at this quantity, it makes no sense if the bottom is a zero. It makes sense, it actually spits out values if the bottom is not a zero. Now if you wanted to do this, If you wanted to find A inverse, how would you do this? You would simply have said, this is that one property of A, this thing is going to be invertible if it is row equivalent to the identity, which means what could you do? You could do row operations until the identity shows up. In other words, if I wanted to fi find A inverse, we would take A, we would augment it with I, we would do all the same elementary matrix steps until, in other words, we do row ops, until A becomes the identity and A inverse is going to be on this side. In other words, what are you doing? You're keeping track of every elementary matrix that you did, which is every row operator. So as we do this, the A inverse shows up. And it ends up being that if you want to, if you wanted to do this for fun, you would do this. A11, A12, A21, A22, 1, 0, 0, 1, and you do all this work until you got one zero zero one, and guess what? That thing, kind of ugly looking, that thing will end up right there. How do you do that? Well, this is a good one to actually, again, if you want to do it by hand, sometimes it's good to learn a technique without using specific numbers. So step one, what do you want to do? I would like that to be a one. So what row op would you do? Let's divide it by A11, right? And then that would become one, A12 over A11, augmented with one over A11, that would be still zero. That'd be A21, that would be A22, and that would be zero, one. That's step one. What's step two? I need to make him a zero. How do I make him a zero? I would multiply row one by negative that, add it to row two, and that would become a zero. But that would be a little bit different. And then how would I make, then I would, that would become something. And then how do I make that a one? I would divide by whatever's there, and now it's a one, and then now it's a one, I would make a zero up above. If you do this, you'll end up with the inverse on the right-hand side. It's a good way to kind of play around and convince yourself you know how to do arithmetic with algebra. In other words, letters, not numbers. Because they're actually numbers, we're just not going to tell you what they are. Right now. So it's a good you know, process to convince yourself that you know how to do college algebra. So given all that, We'll have this following definition. So if A is 2 by 2, it seems from above that when A11, A22 minus A12, A21 equals 0, A inverse does not exist, but when A11, A22 minus A12, A21 does not equal zero, A inverse does exist. And this will eventually, we'll use start of these processes to talk about other words. If the inverse does not exist, what's another word for that? It's non-invertible, it is singular, right? And on the other hand, so if it acts like a zero, right? It's at, this is really what it's saying. It's acting like a zero. How do I know it acts like a zero when that equals zero? It's singular. And so that seems to determine the existence of that, so we're just going to go ahead and make that the definition for now. If A is 2 by 2, so 
A is equal to A11, A12, A21, A22. We are going to f define the determinant of A, which is written as bar A bar. This is not the absolute value. It's bar A bar. Kind of looks like the absolute value, but it is not. We just have to borrow symbols of some sort. It's one of the reasons why debt usually makes your life a little easier. Because, oh, that's the determinant. Because the bar um, is going to be used for multiple reasons. The bar will be used for absolute value sometimes. That depends on what's on the inside. It will be magnitude if it's a different thing on the inside. So it has all these different possibilities. you got to figure out what it is. That's one of the reasons why I use debt a lot. It's simply going to be, when we look at this, just imagine it this way. It's the subtraction of the cross product. <coughs> Take the two sides. Multiply them, cross, subtract them, where we do A11, A22, and then go ahead and subtract A12, A21. And obviously, those are scalars, so it doesn't matter the order that you multiply. A22, A11, A21, A12, who cares? Obviously, subtraction does matter. Now, does this carry down? So this is where we had, you know, two by two. Does this also, this idea, does it also work for what I call the determinant? Do you think it works for a one by one? So that's a two by two. Um, what if A is one by one, which means A is equal to just simply A11? One, one. In other words, it's a scalar. Now, if I say that the answer is I cross-multiply things, well, there's nothing to cross-multiply. So that would mean that the determinant of A, written as bar A, would be just simply, well, it's A11 itself. Now, what was my definition when I looked at this? What seems to be for the determinant? If the determinant equals zero, it doesn't have an inverse. If the determinant is not zero, then it does have an inverse. Well, let's see what that says for us. Um, if A11 was equal to 0, which was the determinant of A, right? If it equals 0, A inverse does not exist. Is this true for scalars? Absolutely. If you have a 0, it does not have a multiplicative inverse. Hey, it's, it seems to be working for 1 by 1 as well. On the other hand, if your determinant of A being A11, does not equal zero, well the non-zero numbers actually have an inverse. So it worked down into one by ones, it works into two by twos, does this march up? What would be the determinant if I start going upwards in my problem and how do I worry about, you know, so this idea is still working so far. So far, the determinant of A11 is equal to A11. The determinant of A11, A12, A21, A22, which is A11, A22 minus A12, A21, supposed to be a 2. And I can calculate determinants of one by ones. I can calculate determinants of two by twos. The rule for the inverse still applies. If it is a zero, non-invertible. If it's not zero, then it is invertible. It actually has an inverse. How does this handle if we go up to, what about three by three, four by four, n by n? How do I handle this thing going up? All right. One of the ways of doing this is this idea of new things that are of larger size are probably based upon old things of smaller size in a particular pattern. Okay, that's the idea of induction. Induction is an inductive process is you have a beginning. That's your basis. After that, you have the inductive step. 
The inductive step is how do I make new stuff from old stuff? And so if you have like the Fibonacci numbers, your basis is zero and one. Okay, how do I make new numbers? Add your last two numbers to get the next. Oh, so zero and one, zero plus one is one. So now I have zero, one, one. How do I get the next Fibonacci number? One, one, two. So I got zero, one, one, two. And then I do one and two is three. And two and three is five, right? And so I have this rule to make the next, right? That's the idea of an inductive process. You have your beginning, which has to be given to you. It's a basis. You just accept this to be true. And then from that on, we build. So this is going to be our basis. We need an inductive rule. And so the basis is, well, where do I start off with? So the basis step is your simplest object, which is the determinant of a one by one object is just the one by one object. It's just scalar. Then we need an inductive rule. Which means, if we would look at it this way, that the inductive step, if it's there's two types of weak and strong, but an inductive step is this. If I understand one by one, how do one by ones make two by two. And then I ask, well, if I understand a two by two, how does a two by two make a three by three? And so you keep going through this process to see how it works out. And one way that we could possibly do that is if I don't quite know how to make the inductive step is you start experimenting. I say, all right, where did this come from? That came from me trying to find the inverse, where I had A, I had I, and I did these row offs. And so for a three by three, we look at it and see, can you start to see the pattern where the one by one was here for the two by two? Do you see the pattern for the two by two into the three by three? And so you look at, say, three by three, and you try to make a reasonable, so I have A11, A12, A13, a21, a22, a23, a31, a32, a33, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. And you just start working. And you try to figure out if there's anything going on. Now, what do you do? What's the first start of work that you do? Well, if I wouldn't worry about making him a one, I could simply say, all right, I need to make that a zero and I need to make that a zero. And we go ahead and make both of those zeros. And let's say we leave the A11 right now. Well, I could make it a one, right? By dividing everybody on the top by an A11 and going through that process. If you make both of those zeros, and this is where you get to do all the fun work. I'll skip. I'll cheat. And if you would do that for the textbook, they do that work for you. And they start off with, this is A11, this is A12, this is A13, that's a zero, that's a zero. And it ends up being that this is A11 minus A21. So, sorry. Do, 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 do. I need a lot more space. I have to write pretty small. A11, A22, minus A21, A12, all divided by A11. And this is A11, A32, minus A31, A12, all divided by A11. And the next guy would be A11, A23, minus A21, A13, all divided by A11, and then this would be A11, A33 minus A31, A13 divided by A11, A13, augmented with whatever is on that side. And you would pause for a second and think, all right, what did I just do? If this is a system of equations, and I would say, if I would go back to a system of equations, these two rows, right, would represent, there's two equations here, 
But how many times does X show up on those two rows? Never. In other words, I eliminated all the X's. So if you would do something like that, you take all the work, you do a little algebra, you pause a little bit on it, this thing would end up being, when I would look at just these two rows, this is a two by two system. X's are zeros on both. So what did I just do? I reduced a three equation three unknown to a two equation two unknown, which is how you solve things by substitution. It's how you solve things by elimination. You pick a variable, you get rid of that variable in the other two equations, and you solve the new system. Well, I already know how to solve this system. It's, two, it's a two equation two unknown. How, when will this actually have a solution? If the determinant of this two by two is not zero. So all I need to do is figure out the determinant of this thing. In other words, that's a two by two, and this will, it can be solved, which means that, you know, a inverse exists. That's the whole point of here, right? This can be solved. A inverse will again exist if its determinant is not zero. But there's another thing that has to happen as well. Not only must its determinant be zero, but also, if we look all the way back here, that can't be zero. If that was a zero, what would that mean? That would mean that you had a free variable. X could be anything at all, which means that this thing doesn't have, this is not row equivalent to the identity matrix. And also A11 must not be zero. So what happens to our problem is, if I need two things, if either of them are zero, it's bad, right? And neither of them can be zero. The easiest check for this is just simply multiply them. If one is a zero, it's zero. In other words, it looks like the determinant of a three by three is just going to be that guy multiplying the determinant of that guy. And that's how the beginning process is. If you want to have, let's see if that kind of works as we go through this problem. So, this part right there cannot be zero. So let's do back to the determinant of a one by one. It's just itself. What's the determinant of A11, A12, A21, A22? It's A11. A22 minus A12, A21. It looks like if I would focus on A11, then those wouldn't be there. I would have the determinant of this guy that I have to determine. That'd be that part right there. And then you have minus, and then you would say, well, what if I would have rather focused on this guy? And then that and that wouldn't be there, and I would have the determinant of this one. It looks like the, the calculator determinants is we pick a row or a column, we just march across it, and it'll end up being plus minus plus minus as you march across it, and then you just need to find the determinant of, well, if I take a row and column out, at five by five, if I take out one row, one column, it ends up being a four by four. 
But if I want to do a four by four, we take out a row and a column, and it ends up being a three by three. And if I take out a row and column, it ends up being a two by two. If I take out a row and column, it ends up being a one by one. In other words, it is inductive. You just have to do, well, a lot of algebra. Now some terms to make this whole go along a row and go along a column inductive stuff. We, we have some terms that are needed. So A is made up of A11, A12, up to A1n, A21, A22, up to A2n, AN1, AN2, up to ANN. Right, so this is n by n, which is obviously made up of a bunch of Aij's. So I have a matrix that is n by n, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to tear it apart by picking a row or a column. And if I'm going to tear this apart by a row or a column and make it a bunch of smaller matrices that I have to calculate the determinant of, we need the following definitions. Um, first, m i j is called the minor of the AIJ element. The minor of the AIJ element, this matrix is all of A except you remove the i row J column. So example, if A was equal to one, zero, negative one, three, one, two, four, one, five, then minor of 2, 1 would be what? What do I want to throw away? The 2 represents the row, so what am I throwing away? Throw away the second row, throw away the first column. What's left if I throw away the second row, first column? The minor is the removal for, hey, who are you going to take out? Well, if I figure out the second row, first column, this is all the numbers that are left. And that's called the minor. So that's the 2, 1 minor, or the ij minor, if we want to do that particular thing. All right. So we have to know what minors are. The second thing that we talk about is the cofactor. So capital AIJ, which is such a terrible notation. <laughs> capital AIJ says that this is a thing that's based on matrix A, but it's using the minor based upon IJ. And so this is called the cofactor. And the cofactor is you take the minor itself and then you calculate the determinant of that minor and then it's either a negative or a positive in front of it and the way it works is you just take minus one to the i plus j position. So that's the cofactor of the AIJ spot. So if we had this example, what would be A21? Well, first off, what's minor 21? We calculated, right? So this would be negative 1 to the 2 plus 1, and I take the determinant of 0, negative 1, 1, 5. And so this would be minus 1, because it's negative 1 to the third power. And what's that determinant? Minus 
it would be zero times five minus a one times a negative one, right? So what would be a two one? Zero, that's a minus minus, makes that a plus. Minus one and a plus one, negative one. And so that's the cofactor of this guy's position. Now, one way of handling the plus minuses for the plus minus of the cofactor Uh, the plus minus of the cofactors forms the following matrix. 1, minus 1, 1, etc. Minus 1, 1, etc. 1, etc. In other words, what happens is for the cofactor expansions, it starts off and it just marches around. You start off with a positive 1 in that position. So if I do a cofactor expansion around here, it's 1 with a minor of first row, first column removed. The determinant of that. And then what about the next position? Well, he has a minus one with a determinant of first row, second column removed. And so it just all, it's just a large alternating matrix. And so if you go through here, you can pick any position. You say, okay, it goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. Just move around between plus, minus, alternate to figure out what it is. Or it's negative one to the i plus j. It's like, hey, what's your spot? Okay, given that we have cofactors and minors, which are used to generate the cofactors, we finally have the following inductive definition. The determinant of A equals the following. It's A11 if A is simply one dimensional, phase one by one. On the other hand, we have what's called the cofactor expansion. Now, cofactor expansions will expand along any row or any column that you choose. So if I would take, for example, row one. Row one is A11, it's A12, it's A13, and then all the way until we get to A1n. And the way the cofactor expansion works is you take the position, the value in that row, and then you ask for, hey, what's your cofactor? And then add, okay, what's the next guy? Well, what's your cofactor? And then we add, what's your cofactor? And then we just keep on going until we get the last cofactor. That's why this is called a cofactor expansion. Now note, you can expand along any row, any column. So that would be the row one cofactor expansion. Um, on the other hand, if you would pick, say, if you pick the i th row, that would be, well, it's the i row first, i row second, i row third, i row nth, and then we just do the i throws first. What are the cofactors for each of those? But on the other hand, we could take, for example, the jth column if we wanted to. What would be the jth column? What would be its indices? It would be the first element of the jth column and then it would be the second element of the jth column, and then it would be the third element of the jth column, and then it would have be the nth element of the jth column. And what are the cofactors that go along with it? Well, the a, a1j, the a2j, the a3j, all the way up to the a and j. The cofactors always go along with the guy that you're expanding around. So you just pick any row, anything, that will become the determinant. Normally we stop at two by two because that's an easy one to memorize. Cross, multiply, subtract, even though it actually follows this rule. All right, how does this work? Let's say I have A is made up of, let's go ahead and do a three by three. 
2, 0, negative 1, 4, 3, 1, 1, 7, 2. What you do is you go along it and then you take advantage of something. And the thing that you're always going to take advantage of is you go back to here and say, I can pick any row, any column that I want. And what's happening? We take the elements of that row or column and multiply them by this whole determinant, you know, based upon cofactor. But if any of those were a zero, would you need to worry about what that cofactor is? No, because zero times anything is going to be zero. And so what you do is you look at your problem and say, who has the most number of zeros? And that's the guy that I'm going to expand along. And so like on this problem here, if we would sit there and say, um, let's say we expand along a column. Which column would you pick that has the most number of zeros? Say that one right there. And so what is the determinant of A? Well, it's going to be 0 times. Well, it's going to be the cofactor of, what's the position of 0? It's first row, second column, and then it'll be plus 3 times. What's, what's the coordinates of 3? 2, 2. And then plus 7 times A. 3, 2. Three, two. Right, it's the coordinates, right? But these are each cofactors. And when I look at this is most of the time when you see these problems, you don't even worry about that. <laughs> it's like, that's zero. Don't even write it. It's, it's zero and it's the added to do nothing. Don't write it at all. all right, so this is really three times as we go through it. All right. Um, this is equal to three times the determinant of, let's leave off this for a second. In terms of the plus minus of those cofactors, this guy in terms of his position would be what? That would be a plus, right? Because it goes plus, minus, plus, minus, right? They alternate as we go throughout. And so doing this would mean, okay, there's going to be a plus here. And if I got rid of what? What are we getting rid of for the 2, 2? What does that mean? Look at 3's position. Who am I getting rid of? Second row, second column. If those are gone, what are the only numbers left? Now the 7, his sign, the plus minus for his position is what? It's minus, so this is going to be minus 7 times. Well, if I get rid of the third row, second column, what are the numbers that are left? 2, negative 1, 4, 1. As long as I did those right. Those little dots look like minuses. But. All right, so this is equal to what? Three times. This is one of the ones where you need to start. This is where your written techniques to start scaling up. Five. And then minus seven times. Six. And so we have 15 minus 42, which is now is, this is where we'll get to this. We'll find out, hey, is that determinant zero? No, therefore I have determined this thing is invertible. When you're doing cofactor expansion, we'll eventually learn a better way of doing it, a faster way of doing it. When's class in? 45. 45. Man, that's in. So, okay. Plenty of time. Um, 
Say, what would be the determinant of, say, 0, 3, negative 2, 1, 4, 0, 1, 2, 3, 0, negative 1, 4, 2, 1, 1. Normally when you start to do determinants, and so you pick the row and the column, whichever one, you can expand along anything you want. But you try to pick the one with the most number of zeros because it will make your life easier. Which one has the most number of zeros? Second column. Second column. So that would make my life a little bit easier. So that's normally what you'll focus on. So if I focus on my second column, this determinant is going to be what? Now go ahead and take care of your sign immediately. The three position, is it going to be a positive or a negative on its cofactor? Negative. Negative, because the first guy to remember is pos positive and then it starts switching. So it would be minus three, the determinant of, well, look at the three position. If I took out his position, which is his row and column, what are all the numbers left? Zero, four, two. Be four, one, two, three, negative one, four, two, one, two. Worst case scenario, no zeros. Right? And then zero, zero, one, positive or negative? Negative, no positive. Positive. So it would be a positive one times. If I take out this guy, this one here means take out his row and his column, who's left? That's nice, at least there's a zero. Okay, so this is equal to negative three all times. Here's where we have parentheses bracket issues. So uh, a big parenthesis, I suppose like determinant was supposed to have a parenthesis on it. Uh, okay. Uh, to do this three by three is gonna have to I'm gonna have to use what? A cofactor expansion. There are no zeros. So pick any row or any column. I don't care. What do you want to do? One. Row one? So let's go ahead and take row one. If I take row one, it's going to be a positive four times the determinant of what? If I would take row this position, this position out. Negative one, four. Negative one, four. One, two. 1, 2, and then it would be, the sign would be what? Negative. So it would be negative 1, determinant. Now, I'm focusing on that 1. Take out his row, his column. If I take out his row and his column, what's left? 3, 4, 2, 2. Okay. So 3, 4, 2, 2. And then plus a 2, and the determinant would be? And then I will have my plus one all times. Well, what do you want to take? The guy with the zero, so let's go ahead and take row one. Which would be zero times, don't care. <laughs> what about this guy? That's a negative two, but what's his sign? Yes. Does it have to be row after the No, you can pick anything you want. Any any time you ever once you have a determinant and you're about to do it, pick any row, any column at any time. Yes? Um, what about the minus two times the factor? Which one? Um, it, from the original matrix, you should... I'm not going this guy. Oh. The, the cofactor, I'm going down this column. Okay. So I took this three here, became that, but where'd the minus come from? His position. Okay. And then zero, zero, I don't even write them. And then this one became him. Why is he plus? Because it goes, mi it goes plus, minus, plus, minus, plus. We worry about the signs, right? And then, but these are determinant of smaller things. So worst case scenario, I have all non-zeros. That would mean that I would have four scalars with four three by three matrices. So one four by four determinant becomes four three by three determinants. I did not, I only wrote two. Why? Because I had two zeros, I don't need to do it. 
And so then a three by three becomes a, like this three by three becomes three two by twos. But this three by three becomes two two by twos because of the zero. It makes life a little bit easier. And I could pick like instead of going there, I, the only reason why I'm going on this row because I like that negative for a second. I'm going to deal with that minus two. So that minus two is, but what's the sign of the cofactor? It's negative. So this becomes negative, negative two, which means it becomes two. And then what would be the, if I would take this row and call them out, what's left over? Four, two, three, four. And then this one is positive. So plus one. And then what would be his minor? Four, one, three, negative one. 4, 1, 3, minus 1. <coughs> and then each of these 2 by 2s are what? You could keep the rule going, like expand along to 1 by 1s, or just simply say it's cross, multiply, subtract. <laughs> Use that and make life easier. But if you look at this, think about all of a sudden, what's the, what's the nest of your difficulty? We're not even done yet, right? <laughs> a 4 by 4 with no zeros at all. A four by four becomes four three by threes. But each of those three by threes, if they had no zeros, would be what? Three two by twos. Mm -hmm. But if I had four three by threes, and each three by three is three two by twos, how many two by twos are there total? Twelve. Twelve. <laughs> right? It became what? Four times three. Let's go up to five by five. A five by five has, if there are no zeros, a five by five is going to have five four, four by fours, fours, but each of those four by fours have four three by, three by threes. threes. Oh my goodness, this is drawing is factorial. <laughs> five of those, four of those, three of those, two of those. The factorial grows really, really fast. Right? Factorial is one of the worst things that you can do computationally. And hopefully we'll get a faster way of doing this because <laughs> basically if we would do something like that, you know, what happens, you know, what happens if you have oh, I'll open that up. Do, 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 do. Ten. Oh, come on, you should enter. Was it shift enter? There you go. How many of you guys want to do 3,628,800 3, of these ops? And that's not even like total multiplications yet. And that's a what? 10 by 10 determinant. Could you do this by hand? Absolutely not. But is the process codable? Yes. But I sure hope there's a faster way of doing this. <laughs> right? And, you know, well, because if, boy, if we get up into, say, 20 factorial. All right, age of the universe, right? Type of issue. So, what do we do? And, like, on this problem here, it's like, we still have to finish it. I'll let you finish that at home. <laughs> are there any things that can make our life a little bit easier? Uh, are there properties of the determinant? All right. Theorem. The first property of the determinant that's actually nice is if you want to calculate the determinant of A transpose, it's still just the determinant of A. Why do you think that's true? What's the transpose do? Switch rows and columns. All right, so the determinant, does it matter which row or column you pick? No. no. So if on this problem, I decided to do a cofactor expansion along column one, would that give me the same answer as row one? Yeah. And row one of this guy is column one of this guy. Oh, they have to be equal. It doesn't. You just the determinant of one has to be the other because it doesn't matter if you pick rows or columns. 
as long as you do a cofactor expansion. So that's why if you take the transpose to determine it, it's not going to cause any changes. Um, the next theorem, which is probably the best of these, is if A is triangular, what's triangular matrix? One of the sides of the diagonal is all zeros. Upper triangular means below the diagonal is all zeros. Lower triangle means above the diagonal is all zeros. All the values exist on the diagonal and one side. That's triangular. Now think about what that means for a second. If I would look at a problem and say, let's take an example. If I would want to calculate the determinant of, say, 1, 2, 3, 4, 0, 2, negative 1, 4, 0, 0, 3, 7, 0, 0, 0, 4. If I wanted to calculate that determinant, what would be the smart thing to do? I probably should pick the first column. Right? And the first column would be what? It would be 1 times the determinant of 2, negative 1, 4, 0, 3, 7, 0, 0, 4. And what's the rest? Zero. Because that's the, I don't even have to write the rest because the expansion is zero times. I don't care what the rest of the determinants are. It's zero times. They're, they're not even there. Okay. Hey, take the determinant of that three by three. What's the smart, what's the smart thing to take? I'm going to take him. And then what would that be? That would mean I have one times two times the determinant of? Three, seven, zero. And what's the determinant of 3704? 3 times 4 minus 0. And so this is 1 times 2 times 3 times 4. Look at the original problem. If it's triangular, the determinant is easy. Multiply the diagonal. Don't do any work. Multiply the diagonal. Why? Because if I did do the work, it would be the same as multiplying the diagonal, right? This is just, then the determinant of A is going to be A11 times A22 times A33 times everything up to ANN. Multiply the diagonal. Man, wouldn't it be great if all of our problems were triangular? <coughs> this ought to give us a little bit of a hint. So if I had a matrix, and I started doing some row operations, which is applying elementary matrices, until it became row equivalent to the upper triangular, the determinant of the upper triangular is easy. I wonder what row ops do to the determinant. Will it tweak it around a little bit or not? Will it modify the determinant at all? In other words, what we're going to need to figure out is what is, if I have the determinant of one matrix that I know, which is trivial, upper triangular, and I'm trying to find the determinant of a row equivalent version of it, right? Row ops made this other guy or went the other direction. How do the determinants relate? And that's what we'll be getting into on the next section. But this is a great property. You don't have to do any expansion. I don't know how many times I've done this on the test, just so you know. I've given a triangular one just to make your life easy, and somebody will do a, a long cofactor expansion, and they'll pick the worst possible thing. <laughs> okay, row one. I'm going to expand along row one because the very first definition in the book is the row one expansion, and they always do row one expansion. And it's like, no, I've, I've, I've said pick the guy with the most right, or even that it's triangular. Don't do it. Just write the diagonal elements, but. You get into a pattern sometimes, you kind of get mode locked and everything. Like when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't heard that before? <laughs> you so need suns. That works for upper triangle also. Right? What? Upper triangle also. Yeah, just triangular. Just, just triangular. And so the last theorem would be this, has two parts. If A has an all zero row or all zero column, then 
the determinant of A is zero. The second thing is if A has identical rows or columns, then the determinant is also zero. So if you look at it and say, oh look, one of these rows, this is easy for the cofactor expansion, right? One of these rows is all zero. How about I expand along that? And the answer is zero. Rather easy to do. Um, the identical rows, on the other hand, happen that when you do this, as you expand it, if they have it, then your lower determinants subtract to zero. And so that's why that one occurs. And really, when, once we get to the fact that row ops form row equivalent matrices have determinants that are based on each other, and it ends up being that if I would have identical rows, and I do a row op, I'll have a row of all zeros. And its determinant will be zero. And then we'll get to that point a little bit. But for now, we have these rather nice properties. But what should we be able to do? Calculate the determinant.